It's great to see you all here this morning. Like John said, the weather is fantastic. We'll take all these days we can get. But don't get too comfortable, though. I don't want to wreck it for you, but you know what comes next, right? <laughs> Just saying. I, I don't want it fall, but then after that, we got to scoop it. We don't want to do that. That's not too exciting. <laughs> so, so it can hang like this for a long time, as far as I'm concerned. We're concluding our series this week, Lessons from the Lord. We've been taking a look at the parables of Jesus. And it's been really interesting to look at the parables of Jesus because there's some great lessons that we can learn from them. He was, in fact, the master teacher, and he's able to share with us and impart to us some real truth and some real wisdom there, some things that we can learn from. The, as we're concluding this series, we're going to take a look at the parable of the sower. It's found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Verses 1 through 9 to start off with. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake, and such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. And while all the people stood there, then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell in the rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, and still other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop of 60, 30, or 160, or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'll skip down with me to verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is a seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is a man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he only lasts for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is a man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Living here in Iowa, we are right in the middle of what would, could be only called flyover country. Um, when people think about Iowa, if you ask somebody from the outside about Iowa or about this area, they would say right away, farming, agriculture. Um, the state fair is going on right now. That is a big focus of the state fair is farming and agriculture. They have all sorts of these really cool tractors you could buy, and they don't let you test drive them there. <laughs> that was kind of a bummer, but they were cool to look at. But when you go there, they have all the crops and the things that have been grown on display for people to see and for people to look at. That's kind of what people think of when they think about this. The funny thing is, though, is we live in Council Bluffs, okay? And so we don't really think about that all that much. When people ask you about your area, this is what we usually do. We said we had this really cool zoo and the College World Series and this downtown old market area. Okay, really, we're talking about Omaha, but we claim all that stuff, right? We're, that's the, we, we're, the, we're like the little brother of Omaha. We claim all that. You know, his stuff is our stuff. We share it. Even if he doesn't like to share it, we share it anyway. We claim it. That's kind of how we operate. So we don't really think about farming all that much, not in this area. But did you know that as of 2012, there were 88,637 farms in Iowa? That's a lot of farms. And they make up, and they're comprised of 30,622,731 acres. That's a lot of farm ground. That's a lot of ground for sure. And it makes sense, though, when you think about it. We're a large producer of things like soybeans and corn and things of that nature. We produce a lot of that. So you have to have a lot of space. You see, in our area of the country, we haven't developed every square foot of our space. We have land where you can grow things. We have land that we can use. And our population just isn't as dense as other places in the country. It just is not. We have some good weather. You may say, we don't have good weather. We do. 
we really do have good weather in this part of the country. It's pretty decent. You know, it's hot sometimes and cold sometimes, and it rains sometimes and it snows sometimes, and we complain about it most of the time. But <laughs> we really do have good weather that's conducive to growing crops for the most part. And on the average typical year, it works pretty well, and it works out pretty good for places to grow. But the other thing that we have in Iowa is good soil that's friendly for growing. You're not going to go out and plant a soybean or a corn crop in the Mojave Desert. That's not going to work. It's too much sand. There are places in the country that are full of hills and rocks that you cannot plant crops in. They're not suitable for growing. The reason it works out like this is we have good soil that helps facilitate that growth. Today we're talking about soil too. And in Matthew 13, Jesus is teaching about this soil. The soil that Jesus is speaking about though is the heart's and the lives of people hearing the message of Jesus. And it's Jesus' desire for his message to grow deeply in our lives, to grow deeply in each and every one of us. There's some lessons that we learn from this parable of the sower that Jesus taught. The first is that God is a faithful sower. It's found in verses 3 through 9 of Matthew 13. We see that. God is a faithful sower. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. And still other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop. 160 or 30 times what was sown. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The message of God's kingdom and his redemptive power is being spread through Jesus and his ministry. This message is continuing to be spread and has been spread throughout generation after generation after generation. God is a faithful sower. And this message of Christ and what he has done for us on the cross continues to be spread. It continues to go out among the world. Do you realize that through persecution, through hardship, despite language barriers, distance, it is being spread all throughout the entire globe. There are people gathering on this day all over to hear the message of Jesus. It continues to be spread, not just here in our little tiny dot corner of the world, but all over the world. The gospel is being spread to a lost and dying world. God is indeed a faithful sower. He continues to take that message out. Sometimes when we look at the task, this whole idea of spreading the gospel, it seems slightly overwhelming. How is it ever going to get done? How is everybody going to hear about Jesus? It seems too big. We're only, we're only a handful of people here. How on earth are we going to do that? But you know what? God has the ability to multiply that, and he has the ability to take that message out. It's easy to get discouraged, but God's message hasn't stopped, and it will not stop. It continues to go because God has given a commission, something that we need to follow. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. This is what Jesus says. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We've been given a commission. We've been given a job. We have to go and take the gospel to all creation. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, this is what Jesus says. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The message of Christ, the message of salvation that God has given to us, it continues to be spread. It continues to go out into the world. God is the faithful sower. He continues to spread this message of hope and truth. Even in a world that doesn't want to hear it sometimes, the message keeps being spread. God has used preachers and teachers. He's used bikers and truck drivers and doctors and store clerks to spread the message. He's used the educated people of the world. He's used people that are barely literate to take the message of the cross to the people that need to hear it. God has a plan. We may want to give up sometimes when we see the size of the task, but God has a plan, and that's spreading the hope 
to all creation and to the lost and dying world. He desires everybody to know him because he's preparing a place for us in heaven because he loves us so much. Most people I know have a to-do list. Raise your hand if you have a to-do list. Even if it's not written down, it's in your mind. Metal to-do list, like I've got to do these few things. Oftentimes, the t- size of the task dictates whether or not we're going to get it done. There's some tasks on some of our list. I'm not saying my list, but maybe my list, but probably not, but maybe so. Have some things on my list that if I live to be 100 years old, they will never get done. They will never get done. There's a huge list, and some of you have those lists, like these big, grandiose ideas, like I need to do this project. Like I'm going to do it at some point for sure. Maybe next year, when I get a little bit more money or a little bit more time. But there are these projects, these things we want to accomplish. Most of these things, though, if they don't happen, if I don't get some of the things done on my to-do list, the only person that really gets all that bent out of shape about it is the person that I live with or the person you live with. Those are the only people that usually care. They're the only people that mind if you get it done or if you don't get it done. They're not that big of a deal. But taking the gospel to all creation is something that we can't ignore. It's something that has to be top on the list. It has to be the most important thing. Taking the gospel to all creation. God desires the world to know him. He's going to continue spreading that message with or without us. He's going to be continuing to take that message to a lost and dying world. And we need to continue to participate in that, to be a part of it, and to help take that message to people that need to hear There's a second lesson that we learn from Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 22. And that is the message of Jesus requires a fertile heart. The message of Jesus requires a fertile heart. Jesus goes on to say, he says, listen to what the parable of the sword means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in the heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell in rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble and persecution come because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. The message of Jesus, you see, it requires a fertile heart. In the passage, there are different types of soil described. The path that they talked about, where it falls and it's immediately taken away. The seed is planted, but they don't really know what to do with it. And immediately the world takes that away. And people take that away. The rocky places, where people get real excited about knowing the Lord. And they start to grow, and they grow up really quick. But then it dies off because they don't have a good foundation in which to grow. And they fade away. The thorny places where the seeds begin to grow, but the things of the world, the struggles, the difficulties, the challenges begin to choke it out, begin to choke out this message. And then there's the good soil. And you see the results are dependent upon which soil and where they're planted, which soil they are. The seed is spread, and the Lord continues to do that and spread his message, but it requires a fertile heart a fertile soil in order to produce the desired results. It requires us to be ready to listen. It requires us to be ready to hear it. Each of us have a choice as to what kind of soil we're going to be, what our lives look like. Are we ready to hear the message? Are we ready to hear the good news of salvation that Jesus has given to us? How do we know? How do we know if our heart is really ready? How do we know if we're growing and if we're the kind of soil we should be? Simple. It's by the fruit that we produce. Turn me to John chapter 15, verse 8. John 15, verse 8. Jesus said this, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You see, our lives need to reflect the fact that we're growing and that we're learning more about Jesus If we live to be 100 years old, we should continue to be growing and learning more about Christ. We should continue to be falling more in love with him each and every day. We're not going to get it or understand it right away. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, not that I've already obtained all this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. 
Obviously, he had some things figured out, right? He said, I don't have it all figured out. I'm growing. I'm learning. I'm learning to be more what it means to be a follower of Jesus each and every day. I mess up. He talked about that as well. He says, I still do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do some of the things I should be doing. He got it. He understood the struggle. But each of us needs to continue to look at our lives and see, are we bearing fruit? Are we bearing the kind of fruit that God has called us to? Do our lives reflect the fact that Jesus is living inside of us? Could people tell that we're a Christian? Do people around us, do they know that we're followers of Jesus? And that doesn't mean we're handing out Bible tracts all the time or we're in constant prayer in front of everybody. But can people tell by the way we treat people, how we love people, how we serve people? Can they tell that Jesus is in our hearts and our lives? Are we doing the kind of things that reflect that we serve a risen Lord? Or do we look just like everybody else? It's a hard question. And sometimes, at least for me, I look better at sometimes than others. Sometimes people can tell and sometimes people can't. And that's something that everybody, I think, needs to work on. Can people tell all the time that Jesus is the king of our hearts and the king of our lives? Has it taken root, this message of Jesus, has it taken root in our lives? Has it continued to grow? Or the things in our lives that we've placed in there or allowed to come apart that are threatening to choke it out? There are things that grow up. Sometimes we have this good soil and we're doing pretty well. And then some things begin to encroach upon it. Some of these troubles of the world, some of the things that we're pursuing begin to encroach upon it and begin to choke out this growth that we have. Where are we at? Are there things that we need to get rid of? Are there things that we need to put aside in order to follow Jesus more fully? I don't know what those things are in your life. I know what they are in mine. And they're a continuous, continual struggle. And there's some things that God has helped see me through and I've kind of have done better and there's some things that I continue to work on and God continues to help me work on but it's important in what we do that we're honoring God with our lives and that we continue to grow and be more like him in everything that we do one of the tasks that gets put off by me all too often in the summer is the job of weeding I don't like to weed very much it's not a lot of fun and usually it's on that to-do list thing that I don't have a lot of time for. And if something's going to give, it's going to be weeding because I didn't like it anyway. So I didn't <laughs> do it. And it's really funny how that works. The projects you don't like to do, those are the ones you don't have time for. It's uncanny, really. But <laughs> there's an area next to my driveway that, frankly, a few weeks ago, it looked pretty rough. And it didn't look very good at all. And I, was, I kept saying, yeah, and Christine said, we need to take care of that. I'm like, busy? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll get on that. It's on the list for sure. We'll get right to it. And so as I went out to mow the yard, because that looked kind of bad too, and I needed to mow it and take care of the rest of the yard, Christine and the girls set about the task of fixing this area. Mom was on a mission, and the girls were in tow, and they decided they were going to weed this particular area right beside our driveway. It's not a huge area, but they were going to weed it and make it look better. It looked great when they were all done. I even pulled a few weeds myself, much to my chagrin. I don't want to take too much credit, though, because it was probably about five or six weeds. But I did pull some. I pulled a few. And when it was done, it looked great. But the thing that really surprised me about it, the thing that, that really struck me was not how great it looked, even though it did great. But what surprised me was within the next couple of days, literally, amaryllis began to bloom. They popped up out of the soil. Next thing I know, they were standing there. And they were not there before. They popped up. And you know what they look like. They're pretty tall and have a nice head on them. And they popped up out of the ground. The weeds that had been there, there had been so much debris and weeds there that they kind of began to choke all those things out. And they didn't get the growth they needed. And as soon as that stuff was gone, lo and behold, they began to grow. They began to look beautiful. And a beautiful thing took place. And they looked so cool with their little pink flowers. And they were all sitting there. And there was a whole bunch of them. And it looked really, really neat. But the weeds that had been there had choked them out. And it didn't look very good at all before that. The message of Jesus requires a good soil and a fertile heart to grow. Anger, greed, lust, resentment are things that can choke out what is there, some things that can choke out these things in our life and what God is planning to do and what God wants to do in our lives and wants to use us for. We need to continually be aware of what type of soil we are because sometimes, I'll be honest, we're better than others. I'm better than others. You're better than others. Sometimes our soil looks pretty good, and sometimes it does not. Sometimes 
things get out of rhythm, out of sync, the priorities shift and things don't look quite like they should. And, we, and if we looked at our soil, we'd say, man, it looks pretty rough. And it's at those points we have to go back to God and repent and say, God, I'm sorry about that. I want to be the kind of soil you want me to be and get rid of those things and start fresh again. And fortunately for all of us, the great part is God says, great, let's do it. And he begins to help us work through those weedy areas, those gross areas of our lives that need to go away. And he begins not only to, to get rid of the help us get rid of those things, but in the end, he makes something beautiful out of it. He makes something that we didn't see there before. He makes something that looks amazing, that honors God. There's a third lesson that we learn from this passage, and that is the message of Jesus can produce powerful results. The message of Jesus can produce powerful results. Let's go back one more time to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. But the one who received the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. In the parable, we learn that the seeds planted can produce results of 160 or 30 times what was sown. The seed planted in our lives can produce amazing results too. The seeds planted in our lives can do great things with God's help. He can grow us and shape us, and we can become and do some great things for God kingdoms, God's kingdom and begin to sow seeds in the lives of others as well. The powerful message of Jesus and his changing grace, it changes people. It changes our life and it changes others. And it helps them to grow and become something amazing. Lives that have been broken and that look hopeless and that look in such disrepair that who could possibly fix them can be changed because of Jesus and his message of the cross and the salvation that he provides each and every one of us, the new hope that we're gaining through him. The question for us is, are we proclaiming the gospel to the people that we meet? Are we sharing this gospel with people around us, to our family, to our coworkers, to our neighbors that need to hear for the very first time and be reminded that God indeed has a purpose for us. Turn with me to Psalm 105, verses 1 through 3. As the psalmist writes, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Hopefully each of us are living a life rejoicing in what the Lord has done in our lives, how he's changed us, how he's made our story something beautiful, how he's written in the pages and made it something remarkable, something that can make a powerful impact on the lives of others, not only just our life. Each of us have a story to tell. Each of us have a story. Each one of us do it. I don't know all your stories. I don't know all your backgrounds. I don't know all the things you've went through. And you guys don't know what my story is either necessarily. But Jesus, in each one of our lives, has shaped us, changed us, molded us, and made us into what he desires us to be. It matters. It matters that we follow Jesus. It matters that we're allowing him to work in our lives. It matters that we're good soil, that we can be shaped into what God has called us to be. In our society, there are people that make a living telling stories. Now, for some of y'all, you're thinking right away, you're thinking books, you're thinking the stories that you read and the things that you enjoy. For me, if you're a music fan, you think immediately of music. And you think of musicians that tell stories through their songs. Names that come to my mind, and probably not yours, because it's just the way that works. Johnny Cash, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, Paul Simon, Tom Petty, just to name a few. These are just some of the guys that tell stories with their songs. They tell stories through their words. When you listen to the stories, you're amazed. And their amazing thing is they can capture your imagination with just a three-minute song. They can capture your imagination with these simple stories put to music. Some of the stories are real, but you know what? Most of the stories that they tell, they aren't. Most of the stories that they tell aren't real at all. Johnny Cash 
did not, in fact, shoot a man in Reno just to watch him die. I just wanted you to know that, <laughs> to dispel any rumors. He did not, and he did not serve time in Folsom Prison. He didn't. The stories, they're interesting, and they're interesting to listen to, but they're not real. These stories aren't real. They make an impact on us, and it's strange that they do, but the stories aren't really that real. But the story that Jesus has done through us and in us, that's real. That's something worth telling. That's something worth spreading the word about. Jesus, through his blood, has given us a better story than all of these. A true story. One that's made a difference for all eternity. One that matters. One that's redeemed us. And one that's allowed us to make a difference in the lives of others. That's the story. That's the good story. God's desire is for the message of Jesus to grow deeply in our lives. God is a faithful sower. He's going to continue to plant seeds in our lives and in the lives of other people. The message that he has is going to produce amazing results if we have a fertile heart. So the question today is, we come to our time of invitation is, where are you at with that? Have you made the decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Is your life the kind of soil that will grow and produce those crops of 30, 60, 100 times what was planted? Are we making a difference in the lives of others? Maybe we've yet to make that decision to make Jesus our Lord and Savior. And I invite you to come as we sing. Or perhaps we've got some weeds in our life. We have some things in our life that we just got to get rid of. And man, we're just struggling like crazy. Um, would love just to quietly pray with you in the front um, and, and build you up and encourage you because we're all in it together. And we just invite you to come as we stand and sing.